Transformer impedance. What is it? How is it determined? And why is it important? Let's start with the last one first. Most electrical systems in a distribution network are supplied by a transformer that steps the voltage down from a high distribution voltage to a much lower user voltage, which is at a level to operate machinery, lighting systems, appliances, and things like that. Now, generally, the high voltage supply has a large capacity for energy to sustain the connected grid. And the concern on the user side then becomes whether or not the user equipment is robust enough to withstand a failure in the wiring system on the consumer side of the distribution transformer. Oftentimes, the equipment will be marked with an amps interrupting rating or short circuit current withstand rating. For example, this 20 ampere residential light commercial duty circuit breaker is rated at 20 amperes, but its AIC or amps interrupting rating is orders of magnitudes higher. This particular one is able to interrupt currents of up to 10,000 amperes. In broad strokes, the supply that is the upstream transformer in most cases is going to supply the majority of the fault current in a short circuit or ground fault. So the question is, how much? And in essence, it's a straight physics problem. The further we're away from the source, in our case, the upstream transformer, the less our available fault current becomes because any added wiring will also add to the total impedance or ohm value of the wiring system, of the circuit. And as the ohm value is higher toward the end of the circuit, the fault current at that particular point will be less than it is back at the source. So for today's video, we'll focus on just the available fault current at the transformer. We're also going to make an assumption, and this assumption is there for simplicity. Because often we don't know the capacity of the electrical system's energy on the supply side of the utilities transformer, we will assume it to be infinite. In the trade, it is often called the infinite bus. It's not truly that, <laughs> but for our purposes, being more precise isn't really of any benefit. So, where can we find out how much fault current is available at the load side connections of a transformer? Many utilities will just publish the information for the particular brand and configuration that they use. For example, in the area of Eastern Washington where I live and work, Avista Utilities is one of the main electricity providers, and they publish a directory, they call it the Blue Book. And I can look up the fault current based on type of service, KVA rating, and voltage system. Also note these other columns where they give some examples of how much the fault current drops after introducing a specific size and length for the service drop or service lateral. Okay, so back to the question of why do we need this information? Well, let's take a look at our codebook briefly and the labeling requirements that we have in 110.9 and 110.10. Notice what the inspector is going to look for in larger gear. And by the way, just as an aside, if you only do residential wiring, this is not often a concern as the utility will size their end of the system to stay well below 10,000 amperes fault current. And that is so that even the least expensive electrical gear may be used in residential markets. Okay, back to our codebook. 110.9, interrupting rating. Equipment intended to interrupt current at fault levels shall have an interrupting rating at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the current that is available at the line terminals of the equipment. And then when we drop down to 110.10, it also requires the following. Equipment short circuit current ratings and other characteristics of the circuit to be protected shall be selected and coordinated to permit the circuit protective devices used to clear a fault to do so without extensive damage to the electrical equipment of the circuit. So, if I've got a breaker or a fuse that protects my electrical circuit, when it trips under a short circuit, we want it to stay together. We don't want it to blow apart, right? We have to be within that rating. Now that brings us to the next point, and that is, how do we calculate that number? How do we know how much fault current is available at a particular point? 
Now, I do have to mention that in a large commercial or industrial facility, you will also need to consider all sources of fault current, not just the supply side transformer. In a short circuit or ground fault, any downstream inductive loads, motors, transformers, they briefly become sources of voltage and current as the magnetic fields collapse back inward on the windings. And they will give a fault current contribution as well. Now for today, we will ignore those values, those sources of fault current, and just focus on the source transformer. A transformer has a nameplate with several values that are stamped onto it. So what are the things that we're going to need? Well, there are four items that we'll need off of a transformer nameplate. We need to know the KVA. That's the total amount of energy that the transformer can transform or displace at 100% of its rating. We also need to know the secondary voltage, the phasing, whether it's single phase or three phase. And lastly, a key ingredient is the percent impedance. And the nameplate will have more information than that on it, but those are the four items that we need to do the math. Now, in a simplified form, you could just, if you know the amp rating per phase, you could just take the amp rating per phase and divide it by the percent impedance as a decimal, and you will get your line-to-line -line fault current. So, for example, if I have a transformer that is rated at 250 amperes with a 2% impedance, I can expect a dead short at the transformer to deliver 250 divided by 0 0.02 equals 12,500 amps. Right? So if we know the 100% rating in amperes and the impedance, that's, that's an easy bit of math. But usually we work with the KVA. And that expands the formula a little bit. So let's try this with the following single phase transformer. Notice that it is rated at 25 kVA, has a 240 volt single phase secondary, and 1.6% impedance. Okay, let's write out the formula that we need. The available fault current equals kVA times 1000 divided by open bracket line to line voltage multiplied by the percent impedance as a decimal close bracket. And the reason that I write the brackets or include them here is that if you're punching this into a calculator without the brackets, it's going to mess up your order of operations. So the brackets are here to keep your order of operations correct. All right, here we go. Let's plug the numbers in 25 times a thousand divided by open bracket 240 times 0 0.016 close bracket equals 6,510 amperes. Okay, now let's try a three phase example. And by the way, it doesn't matter if the three phase transformer is Y connected or delta connected on the secondary. The math is exactly the same. It's the same formula. Now don't misunderstand me. It matters a great deal how you connect your transformer in the field to get the desired voltage and current. But as far as the formula is concerned, it doesn't matter how it's connected. We do have to modify the formula a little bit though for three phase. So here's the formula for three phase. Available fault current is equal to KVA times a thousand divided by open bracket, line to line voltage, multiplied by the root of three, or 1.732, multiplied by the percent impedance as a decimal. All right, here's our next transformer. Now, notice that on this particular nameplate, there are dual ratings. And the rating that we choose depends on the selected temperature rise. Uh, we will use the numbers on the left, which are for a 60 degree Celsius temperature rise. So this particular transformer is rated at 225 kVA, 208 volt three phase for the secondary, and 2.8% impedance. All right, now that we have the numbers, let's plug that into our formula. 225 times 1000 divided by open bracket 208 times 1.732 times 0 0.028 close the bracket equals 
about 16,570 amperes. So those are the practical formulas, the application that we will need to be able to place a label on the gear to comply with NEC 110.9. Now granted that for the service gear, you would also need to take into account the impedance of the service conductor, which will drop the fault current, and also any motor contributions from within the facility, which will contribute to the fault current. But that's all material for another video. Now here's the question. How do they find that number that's stamped on the nameplate as the percent impedance? Do they make a transformer, a prototype, put a high current probe on it, stick it on the workbench, create a short circuit, and then have the bomb squad ready? Well, <laughs> as fun as that sounds, it's not quite how it's done. It is short circuited. It is tested, but never at full voltage. We don't want to blow the transformer up. So we reach back to some stuff we may have learned back in physics class and have long forgotten. But the practical aspect of it is this. We can put a transformer into a test circuit, put it under load, and use just enough voltage to fully saturate the core metal with a magnetic field of the same strength that it would experience under normal conditions. And then we take some measurements and extrapolate from there. Now, the first time that I saw this demonstrated, I was blown away because it is such an elegant way of getting the information we need. I don't have large equipment to try this on a distribution transformer. So what I'll do is I'll use this control transformer instead. The physics are the same. It doesn't matter. And if you have something similar at your disposal, you too can replicate it and figure out the impedance of your transformer. So why don't you join me at the workbench and I'll demonstrate how the impedance of this transformer is derived experimentally. Here's the diagram of the test setup that we'll be using. First of all, we need a variable AC power supply on the line side or the high side of the transformer, along with a voltmeter. Next, we're going to short circuit the secondary, and it's going to be short circuited through an amp probe or amp meter. We also need to know the volt amps or the kilovolt amp rating of the transformer. What we will try to do is raise the voltage just enough so that we fully saturate the core, that the magnetic fields that are in the core are equal to the 100% rating of the transformer. And we'll know that we've reached that by looking at the secondary amps, the shorted amp meter, and we're going to look for the 100% rating of the amps output on that meter. When we have reached that point, we take a look back at the voltmeter and we use that value divided by the normal rated line voltage of the primary and multiply it by 100. And that will give us the percent impedance. So it's a very, very simple test. So here I've got our test set up. On the left hand side, I've got a voltmeter, our transformer under test, and an amp probe or an amp meter on the right hand side. And just off the screen, I've got a variable voltage supply that I can take from 0 to 120 volts AC. Now, the transformer itself has a nameplate output of 150 volt amps, which means that at 115 volts output, that's about 1.3 amps. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to slowly raise the voltage, and you'll see that indicated here on this meter. But the one that we're actually going to watch is this one over here. That's the important one. What we want to find is the point at which the magnetic field is fully saturated inside of this core. We get that when we have 1.3 amperes on the output side. And once we have that, we're going to see what the voltage level is at on the primary side, and then we'll take it from there. So here we go. So again, we're watching the right-hand meter and we're looking for 1.3 amperes. And we're getting closer. I'll go slow, it's easy to overshoot. 1.3, that's close enough. Okay, and what we want to take note of is that we've got about 41 volts here. For our purposes, 41 volts is gonna be accurate enough. Okay, here's the method. To be able to get the percent impedance, we're going to take 
this 41 volts divided by the rated input voltage, which I've got this on the 460 volt taps. So 41 divided by 460 times 100 gives us 8.9% impedance. So 8.9% impedance is, if this had a stamp with the impedance on it, that's what would be stamped on it. Uh, small control transformers like this don't have the percent impedance on it. But now that we know that, what would happen? I'm going to try this. What would happen if I raised my primary voltage to 460 volts here? Um, well, it would let all the carefully packaged smoke out and it would destroy the transformer. We don't want to do that. But we can calculate how much current would flow if we had a dead short with 460 volts on the primary input side. Right? So we know that it's 8.9% impedance. We know that our standard output current is 1.3 amps. And so we can just go 1.3 divided by 0 0.089 equals 14.6 amps. So in a dead short, I would expect to see 14.6 amperes before the windings start burning up, and they will. So we put fuse protection on these things so that if something bad happens, we protect our transformer. As I said, it's a simple yet effective way to determine outcomes in failure mode without having to do destructive testing. Additionally, it's not only transformers that benefit from this particular test method. Motors and generators can also be tested for torque values in this manner at a reduced voltage. We take measurements, extrapolate. We can also test for locked rotor current values in motors. Same method. Now look for those in another video coming soon. Until then, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you found value in this video, please subscribe, hit the like button, and we will see you in the next episode.